All right, let's get started. Um, I, I hadn't gotten an announcement slide done yet, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, forego that. Um, so while everybody's calming down from the celebration that we had in steel design a little bit ago, uh, I'll just recall a few quick announcements off the top of my head. So number one, um, you have your homework due on Friday for sheer. So do, um, I guess I should ask if anybody has any questions, because this is the last chance that you have to ask them. So does anybody have any questions on the homework? Yeah, alternatives reports, yeah. <laughs> well, um, as long as it happens between now and Friday. So. <laughs> Thursday starting at 9.30 a.m. once the alternatives are done? No, I don't think I know, but it's not as dramatic. <laughs> you got to have the, the theatrics to it. No, 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 but, but it, that doesn't have the dramatics to it. Everybody knows what's going on with this. <laughs> True. All right, all right, all right, all right. Back, back to concrete design. Okay, so I have put a box outside my office that says, you know, uh, CE 413 homework 6. I've already gotten a couple people have already submitted the homework. So the due date is Friday and it's 5 o'clock, okay? I need it turned in by 5 p.m. because at 5 p.m. I'm out. So I'm taking them with me. 5 p.m. Friday. What's that? I'm just pretty much going to be here. So. Alas. I'm I'm boring. All right, all right. No questions on homework uh, uh, six. Then, then we're going to go ahead and press on. Um, remember, you all, your exam is after spring break, so just keep that in the back of your head. Your exam is going to be on shear, and it's going to be on our current topic, which is serviceability. So I do want to try and make some headway. I know everybody's sort of um, getting over the exam, but fortunately, a lot of the uh, work that we're going to be doing today is going to be uh, comprised of stuff that you've seen before. Yes, sir? What day is our exam? I have it right now scheduled for April 5th. Okay. Is the week after we get back? No, no. The week after that. Yeah. We get back on the 27th. It's the week after that. See, I'm not completely horrible, right? All right, all right, let's talk about, about reinforced concrete design. All right, so let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. Okay, all right, all right, everybody, so I know everybody's all, all fired up. And uh, after that riveting exam we just had, um, actually there were no rivets on the exam, so. Um, so let's get back into the world of concrete, and we're talking about deflections. Now, when I say serviceability, I, what I mean is the, uh, a limit state associated, uh, in this case, or in this course, associated with deflections. There's a difference between whether or not a structure is um, safe, in other words, if, if it has enough strength to safely resist loads, and whether or not that structure is serviceable. You know, does it perform well uh, in its uh, in its day-to-day -day capacity? So. One of the ways that we assess that in the world of structural engineering is we control uh, its deflections. So we really need to be able to do two things, control or calculate deflections and then compare those com uh, deflections against specified limits. So we're going to start off trying to compute uh, deflections. Now, first off, you all had me for structural analysis, so I know that you can compute basic deflections in beams. You know, principle of virtual work, remember you place that imaginary one kip load, on the beam and then you double in, you know, you integrate uh, little m times big M over EI, integrate across the length. I know you all can do that. You all are experts at that. <coughs> if you don't, <laughs> if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You can use the, uh, the guides uh, that I provide. You know, for instance, if I have a simply supported beam, concentrated loaded mid-span, you know, you know the moment is PL over 4. I mean, we've seen that up until now. 
but the, uh, the de maximum deflection at mid-span is PL uh, PL cubed, PL to the third, uh, divided by 48 EI. So you all can, um, uh, can, can look that up pretty easily. The, the problem, and this is a problem that is unique to reinforced concrete design, for instance, we won't discuss this at all in steel, is the fact that as loads increase on a, a beam, the uh, beam's susceptibility to cracking uh, also increases. So if I've got a beam, let's say it's got a uniformly distributed load, your moment diagram kind of takes that parabolic shape, you know, something like that. Well, there, there is a point when those moments will start to um, exceed MCR, your cracking moment. So the, the point is, is that under a given set of loading, it's very possible that some of the beam is cracked and some of it isn't, okay? So when I use this uh, PL to the third divided by 48 EI, which I value do I use? Do I use the moment of inertia for this section or the moment of inertia for this section, okay? And the answer is neither, okay? What you do is you use what's called an effective moment of inertia, and it's kind of like a a weighted average, if you will, of your gross moment of inertia and your cracked moment of inertia, of your moment of inertia of your transformed section. So this is going to bring back a lot of stuff that we did, you know, uh, uh, a, a significant time ago. Things like cracking moments, things like um, uh, moments of inertia of transformed sections. Remember when you turn the concrete in, or the steel into an effective lump of concrete? Y'all remember that? We're going to bring all that stuff back and we're going to bring it back today. So I want everybody to sort of get your memory banks uh, jogged because we're going to be uh, using this uh, here in a little bit. Is everybody all right? all right? Now one thing to keep in mind, where, where we are not assessing safety, we are not assessing strength, we do not apply load factors at all. We do not use 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live because those load factors are intended to capture the uncertainty associated with whether or not an element is going to fail. We're not talking about failure here, we're just talking about day-to-day -day performance. So instead of using 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live, it's just dead plus live, okay? And that's it. Now, the added complication with reinforced concrete design that you will not find in structural steel design is the more load that you apply, the more cracking that occurs, okay? So if I want to find the deflection due to only the live load, I can't compute it directly because there is never a case where a beam experiences only its live load. Now what, what happens in the real world? You set the beam on its support so it's seeing its dead load and then you put live load on top of that. So first it's seeing its dead load and then it's seeing its dead load plus its live load. So you compute the deflection associated with the dead load, then you compute the deflection associated with the dead load plus the live load, and if you only want the live load deflection, you take the difference of those two. You can't compute live load deflection uh, d uh, directly because more load equals more cracking. And for these two instances, you're going to have different moments of inertia. Yes, sir? That's a good question. The reason why you would only want the, um, the live load deflection is as follows. Okay, um, <laughs> dead load deflection, we can kind of get around through a, uh, a number of creative means. And I can give you kind of an, an, an example in, uh, in steel design that actually makes uh, a little more sense, and I'll, I'll talk about how we can use, do this in concrete. So in steel design, let's take a, a beam, set it on its supports, and pour the concrete slab, right? Would you agree that if I've got a beam and I've got all that load on it, it's going to deflect downward? Like it's going to have some downward sag to it. Well, what I can do in the fabrication shop is I can actually take that beam and bend it, physically bend it upwards, so that when I set it down, set the slab on it, it sits flat, okay? That technique is called cambering. So in terms of a lot of our deflection limits, you won't find very many deflection limits associated with dead load because we can get around that, okay? In steel design, we can actually bend the beams upward. In concrete design, we can cast them so they have a little bit of upward camber. That, that's not that terribly... Uh, terribly difficult to do. But we can't really get around uh, the live loads. You know, live loads change and under various live loads the beam is going to deflect. What we can do is ensure that it isn't deflecting too much. Okay? Does that make sense? That's a great question though. Yes, sir? Yeah. Uh, 
Not really, but, but I'll say this. Um, given certain pre-stressing scenarios, it is possible that for a pre-stress beam, when you lock that pre-stress in, it does tend to want to curve up a little bit. But the reason that we pre-stress is, is inherently different. When we pre-stress a concrete beam, what we're trying to do is eliminate as much tension in the beam as possible. Because concrete, as you know, is a material that is very, very strong in compression, but very weak in tension. And if we can eliminate some of that tension, we can ultimately make the beam more uh, like lighter and more slender. Does that make sense? Now, that doesn't mean that, that if you uh, pre-stress a beam, you don't get camber. Yeah, yeah you, you, in most cases, you will get a little bit of that upward bend because if like here's your beam and your cables are you know down in the tension region when you apply that pre-stress it'll want to curve up a little bit does that kind of make sense but yeah so you do get that added perk yes sir see I'm good like that <laughs> just kidding um, anybody else this is good stuff yes sir No, I, I see what you're saying, but, but the, the deflections that we're talking about are very, very small. I mean, like we're talking about like for 30-foot beams, we're talking about cambers of like that, like three-quarters of an inch. So we're not talking, you know, about a, a foot or so. We're talking about very, very slight values. Oh, you're asking big questions. That, that is pre-stressed concrete questions. Um, pre-stressed concrete could be its, its own class in and of itself. And we would talk about all that different stuff. I mean, there's, there's issues with pre-stressed losses. There's issues with uh, different pre-stressed conditions. Are you only going to partially pre-stress? Are you pre-tensioning or post-tensioning? That's a great question. And to answer it, we'd have to... <laughs> Go to grad school, <laughs> is all I'll say. <laughs> um, anything else? This is good stuff. All right. So what I want to do is I want to look at um, the, the following beam. Now, um, I, I, I have a word in here which might not make a lot of sense right now, and the word is instantaneous. Um, sometimes you'll see the word instantaneous. Sometimes you'll see the word immediate. I don't know which, really which one's better, but um, uh, I'll kind of explain what's going on. So when we say instantaneous or immediate live load deflections, what we're saying is, here's the concrete beam, put the load on it, what's the deflection right then, right when you put the load on it, okay? Um, we're gonna calculate instantaneous deflections, and then later on, we're gonna calculate long-term deflections. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is, if you take a concrete beam and put load on it, it will deflect. But if you leave that load there for about 20 years and come back later, that deflection will change, okay? Because concrete is just one of those materials that's properties change over time, okay? Um, the the uh, uh, properties of, uh, of a sample of concrete now versus 20 years from now are different, okay? So you'll end up getting, actually, more often than not, you'll get increased deflection uh, over time. So the first thing we'll compute is instantaneous deflections, you know, right when you place the load, and then we'll look, well, how do those deflections change uh, over time? Is that how you can count the amount of cambering that you want on the beam? I'm not really for sure counting. Kind of, but, but, but the amount of cambering that you get on your beam, it's more of a function of how much dead load you have on the beam. You're trying to overcome that. I'll get the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'll say this: the modifiers that we use for dead loads and live loads are a little different because dead loads are always there. Live loads could be sustained over different periods. No. No, I'm just saying if I put a load on the beam, what's the, uh, what's the deflection right then? Impact is if the load is placed over a very sudden period instead of 
doing this, impact is doing that. Okay, that's different. Okay, you're asking because of senior design. I know. We will handle impact in there. Don't worry. But uh, we handle it in a very simplified fashion. Yeah, but warehouses are on the ground. Like the, the scenario you're talking about, well, the scenario you're talking about, more often than not, the equipment is, we're talking about a slab on grade on the ground. We're not really, I mean, again, these, these beams and stuff that we're, we're talking about elevated beams up in the air. You see what I mean? Like this is the ground. This is like going to the ground. If we were on the second floor, we'd be having a different discussion. You, you see what I mean? Everybody else okay with that? Okay, any other questions? All right, so um, we've got uh, a simply supported beam. Uh, it's 20 foot long. Now it has a dead weight of one kip per foot, and we're saying that that includes the self weight of the beam, so we don't have to worry about computing that. The live load is uh, 0.7 kips per foot. We've got three KSI normal weight concrete, and uh, using these quantities, I want to compute the instantaneous live load deflection. So what I got to do is compute the um, the uh, dead load deflection, the dead load plus the live load deflection, and then I have to subtract the two to get just the live load deflection. All right, but in order to do that, I got a lot of fundamental properties I got to compute on the back end before I even get to uh, computing deflections. So I should have opened my little smart pad notebook earlier. So that's going to take a while. Anybody know any good jokes? Adding one more wheel would have been a real trial, right? <laughs> All right, we're on what, 15A? Wow. Man. That one was a doozy. You said he's got that one in the chamber. <laughs> that was pretty good. All right, all right, all right. All right, so let, let's write down some, um, some parameters right off the bat. So beam parameters. So we've got the length of the beam. It's 20 feet, which is 240 inches. Um, the dead load is one kip per foot. Now that includes self-weight. I can't help myself with that uh, bicycle joke was off the chain. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't help myself. <laughs> Whew. I love this job. <laughs> We've got FC prime of three KSI. <laughs> We've got uh, B is 12 inches. We've got D is 17 inches. Now, one thing I will point out, up until now we've actually kind of been ignoring H. H is um, 20 inches. We actually are going to need that because we're going to need it for um, uh, uh, for moments of inertia. Now that one was good. That one was good. We're shifting gears. And we've got three square inches of steel, right? Because it's three number nines. Am I right on that? Okay, all right. Now, in order to compute deflections, we're going to need an effective moment of inertia. 
And in order to compute a moment of inertia, an effective moment of inertia, we need some parameters. Okay? So I'm going to start off with some of the parameters that are constant. Okay? And first parameter that's going to be constant throughout all this is the gross moment of inertia. So how do we compute IG? Well, no, that, that's ITR. That, we are going to do the transform section method here in a second, but, but yes. There you go, BH cubed over 12. No, base times height, BH cubed over 12. Yeah. Now, it, why, why are we using BH cubed over 12? It's a rectangle. If it was not a rectangle, then we'd have to use the parallel axis there. Remember, set up the table, the A, the Y, the AY, the I not D. Remember all that? Like, we'd have to go through and do all that. We did that in here, like, way, like, in January, I think. So, 12. Twenty inches cubed over twelve. What do we got? This, what's that? Eight thousand. What? There you go. Remember, add that. Now, okay. This is the gross moment of inertia. One other param, another parameter that isn't going to change uh, throughout this is our cracking moment. Okay. Now, pop quiz. How do we compute the cracking moment? Anybody remember the formula? All right, hold on, hold on, let me write this out. There we go. F sub R times IG over YT. Okay, so we've got I sub G. Now, does, let's take Y sub T. Anybody remember what Y sub T is? The distance to the tensile region. The distance to the, from the centroid to the tensile region. So how do we get from the centroid of this beam to the, uh, to the extreme tensile fiber? H over, so that's uh, 20 inches over 2, which is 10 inches. Now, so we've got F, we've got IG, we've got Y sub T, and then we need FR, right? FR, which is our modulus of rupture. Anybody remember how to compute F sub R? It's a function of FC prime. Oh... All right, hold on. There you go. 7.5 lambda square root of FC prime. Ooh, bringing it back, right? So what's lambda? One, and why is it one? There we go. All right, and what's FC prime going to be? 3,000, there we go. So 7.5, one square root. PSI. So what do we got? So we'll say 410.8. Okay. So therefore, cracking moment is FR IG over YT which is 410.8 PSI times 8,000 inches to the fourth, and then this is 10 inches. Now, let me ask you a question. We're calculating a moment, so if I just plug and chug right now, what are the units going to be? Inch pounds. Now, this is a moment, so if I want to take this moment of inch pounds, and convert it to foot kips, what do I need to do to this? Multiply or divide? <laughs> divide. So what I'll say is one foot kip is 12,000 inch pounds. Remember that was our little shortcut? So what does that come out to be? 27, we'll, we'll carry this one out one more, 27.39, right? 
I got a second on that? It's not too bad, right? Pretty straightforward. So far so good? Now I'm going to start testing your memory banks a little bit. Okay? Now, when we um, compute a cracking moment, remember one of the things that we were trying to determine was under a given amount of moment, we were trying to determine whether or not the beam has cracked. So if I've applied about, we'll say, 10 foot kips of moment to this beam, then this beam will, have not, will not have experienced cracking, right? Because 10 foot kips is less than our cracking moment, and everything's fine. Now, if our moment is larger than the cracking moment, remember that doesn't mean that the beam put a feather on it and it explodes. What that means is, is that we have to use our transform section, right? Remember, all of our concrete that's in tension, we assume ineffective, and then we take that steel and we convert it into an effective lump of concrete. Remember that? So, everybody got this? You need a minute? Good? Okay. All right. So <coughs> we're going to now compute our cracked or our transformed moment of inertia. I missed something. Oh, I'm pretty sure I did. Wow. Wow. We're at dentistry jokes now. <laughs> wow. Whew. Okay. Now, how wide is the beam? 12 inches. Now, if you recall, when we did this transform section analysis, we were trying to determine a value of x here, right? Okay. So if this top dimension is x, what's that bottom dimension? What's that? Not tw not, every, not, tw not 20 minus x because how far is it from the top to the steel? 17. So it's 17 minus x. Okay. Now this quantity right here is NAS. Remember that? Now what's the area of steel? Three. Three square inches. And what's N? The modular ratio. Now see, we're bringing it back. Okay, so to compute the modular ratio, we need two things. We need the modulus of elasticity for steel and the modulus of elasticity for concrete, right? All right. There we go. Hold on. I, I should I should give you the professor look for that. Hold on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the professor. All right. Now this is the modulus of elasticity for steel. Do y'all remember how to compute it for concrete? For normal weight concrete, that is. Ooh.
Remember that? Re oh, you, you, <laughs> you, <laughs> do you all remember this? Slide 74. Right, well, 57,000. He, he just said it. I'm not that good. <laughs> I'm sorry, God. Woo. I love this job. I really do. I'm so lucky. I'm not even joking when I say that. Um, what, what's that, C Prime? Well, that's a good question. When we plug in, now hold, now hold, hold on. She, she, she's making, no, hold on, she's making a good point that, that our, our uh, E sub S is in KSI, and then this will ultimately be in PSI. If we want, we can say, you know, one KSI is a thousand PSI, and just go ahead and compute that now. That's, yes, so, so, so she's right. All right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's settle it. What do, what do we got? 3122. We'll just leave it that. that. That's fine. Okay, so therefore, our N is ES over EC, which is 29,000 KSI divided by 3122 KSI. And what does that come out to be? Say it again. 9.29. So, if you recall, what what did we usually do with with uh, n values? What's that? Nearest whole number. So that's going to be nine. Okay. So that means that this quantity here is 27 square inches. Just to keep it simple. I mean, if you want, you could use the 9.29. I mean, it will change your answer slightly, but I don't know that it really, really matters. Plus, you also got to keep in mind that even our estimate of, like, think about it like this. N is computed based on this, based on 57,000 square root of FC prime. 57,000 square root of FC prime is not an exact calculation for E sub C. It's an estimate. It's a best fit. So... Just to keep things, you know, in perspective, rounding this to a uh, whole number makes, be, I'm, are you sure it is exactly 9.29? No, but it's probably around 9. Okay. So, now, in order to find X, do you all remember how to find X? Like, what, what did we do with this cross-section? There we go. So, summing moments. And I'll go ahead and put a neutral axis symbol right there, neutral axis. So summing moments about the neutral axis. So we have the moments above contributing above the neutral axis must equal the moments that are contributing below. So above, we have an area. What's the area of that big block? 12x. And since everything over here in this diagram is in inches, I'm just going to be uh, simple and leave the, the inches part off. So we have 12x. Now, what's the moment arm from the neutral axis to that block? x over 2. Because what I'm asking is how far is it from the neutral axis to that centroid, the center of that block. So 12x is the area, and then from here to here, that's half that. That's x over 2. Okay? Now, that has to be equal to the area below, and what is the area below? 27. So 27 times, and what's the moment arm? 17 minus x. So on the left, we have x and x, x squared, 12 over 2. 6x squared, 
The area of steel is three, because it's three number nines, and then the N is nine. All right, 27, and we gotta factor this out, 27 times 17, that is 459 minus 27X. So that is 6X squared plus 27X minus 459 equals zero. So of course you can plug that into your Casio FX 115ES plus, right? Or you can use other devices. No HPs? Say it again. 6.78 6, uh, 6 you said? We'll say 6.781. Okay. Now X2, that comes out to be like negative 11.281, something like that. What's your, are, is this positive, positive, negative? All right. So which one do we take? Non-negative one. <laughs> Whoa. You all are just ready for spring break, is that it? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, guys. All right. <laughs> All right, well, for, for, has everybody got this? like something the joker would pull if he was a professor. It's just a joke. I'm not I'm not going to do that, you know, have this massively long exam and then at the end goes if you actually read everything just, you know, write your name and uh, I'm not doing that. Ah. Uh, All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so we've got our x value, so now we can start uh, we can start performing our, our transform section analysis. So if you recall, we had a big table. We started off, we had a shape. And for this section, we've got two shapes. We've got the concrete. Bless you. We've got the steel. Okay. Now we need our moment of inertia for each shape. Let me ask you a question. What's the moment of inertia for the steel component going to be? Zero. zero. There's no there's no height. It's just a lumped area. This is zero. Now how do we compute the moment of inertia of that block of um, uh, uh, steel or that block of concrete? Not BH cubed over 12. Not BD cubed over 12. BX cubed over 12. Well, yeah, but I'm trying to be consistent with the notation. I don't want to use H. You go, well, why didn't you use the 20? No, it's, it's the X of 6.78. So tell me what you get for BX cubed over 12. Remember, the B is 12 inches. What's that? 311 point, what, like 83? All right, we'll just leave it like that. All right, do I have that value seconded? Okay, all right. Now we have, we need the area of each shape. Now what's the area of the steel going to be? 
27, because that's just NAS. Now, what about the, uh, the concrete? How do I compute the area of that? BX, right? So what is BX? What? 81? Did you say 81? Oh, I thought you said 1.3. <laughs> so 81 point, we'll say 81.4. All right. Okay, now we need the, um, we need the D distance. So we need the distance from the neutral axis to the centroid of each shape. So how far is it from, let's do the concrete first. How, is, how far is it from the neutral axis to the center of the concrete? X over 2. And what's X over 2? Three 3.39? And what about uh, from the neutral axis to the center of the steel? Is it 11.22? 10. 17 minus x. Now, if you've got the i value, the a values, and the d values, how do you, what do you do from there? i plus a d squared. There you go. So we need i plus a d squared, and that's going to be in inches to the fourth. So I can get rid of all this. So each row, tell me what you get. For, for the top row, you said? 2819.5. And up here, you got what? Do I have a second on that? I don't have seconds. Second on the top. I know. I know. I know. It's 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 like it's like I'm getting you all to actually go back and go through your notes, bringing them back. All right, so we're good on these values. So add these up, what do you get? 4,066.4. So what I'm saying is that the cracked moment of inertia is 4,066.4 inches to the fourth, you know, plus or minus some rounding. Okay. Are you all okay with this? Okay. When you compute an effective moment of inertia, you need four quantities. Okay. You need a gross moment of inertia. You need a cracked moment of inertia. We've got both of those. The gross moment of inertia is about 8,000, or it is 8,000, and the cracked moment of inertia is 4066.4, right? Those are two quantities, gross and cracked moment of inertia. You also need two moments. You need a cracking, what's that? You need a cracking moment, which we have our cracking moment, and it is? Okay, so 27.39 foot tips. And we also need an applied moment. Now, here's the thing. The cracking moment, I want everybody to pay attention to this, all right? The cracking moment um, doesn't change. But as you do different load cases, your applied moment will change. So for every different load case, you're going to have a different applied moment. And for every applied moment, you're going to have a different moment of inertia. And for every moment of inertia, you're going to have a different deflection. Okay? Does that make sense? We will attack that when you get back. Everybody, you have a fantastic spring break. Don't forget the food at noon or 1 or whenever it is. 
What? The event is from noon to one. I don't know what's going on after. So. The governor's going to be here at noon, so that I know. So. So if you can make it, please uh, attend. I know they're wanting a big turnout. Um, that, that's all I got. You all have a fantastic spring break. If I don't see you, don't forget your homework in the box outside my office. <laughs>